Welcome. We are ready to present. So if you guys are ready, we will continue. So good morning. We are doing a presentation on the once in future wallet. This is the ECC wallet uh, and how we got where we are. My name is Kevin. I am the UX designer or lead designer for the electric coin company. Hey, um, I'm Paku. I'm the principal mobile developer on the wallet team. I mostly do iOS. Awesome. We represent the, the wallet team that's three to five people, uh, full-time employees with a group of community members and some contractors uh, supporting us as well. Um, there are some current problems going on with the wallet, which we will talk about a little bit later in the presentation. If you're here for that, please bear with me. We will get there. But we wanted to quickly kind of recap why we are all here. So why cryptocurrency? Why are, why are all these individuals and teams so interested in this technology? Well, you might call it math diamonds, digital gold, decentralized money, internet money, magic money, whatever it is that you would like to call it. It started out really as a technology to hedge against inflation. So fiat currencies are inflating. It's just part of how they work. And you used to be able to invest in gold or silver or put assets in hard goods like a car or even a toaster, but you can't really easily divide half of a car. You can't really pay someone and barter with part of a car. It works across all borders. Um, that's part of the reason we like cryptocurrency. It's internet money. It's digital. Trust is not as required. Um, what we mean by that is you do need trust for certain services and maybe certain coins, but it's, it's an immutable ledger. All your information is out there. So trust is not as required since you can go prove things. For some people, probably everybody in this room, we like it because it's just really cool as well. Uh, but also people are investing with cryptocurrencies. They're either speculating on the price going up or just allowing it to appreciate over time. Um, but at its base concept, uh, Bitcoin originally, it's still missing some things. So why Zcash then? Well, Bitcoin is missing a key part uh, for having an open and fair uh, economy, which is privacy. You, can have, you can't have like fairness uh, without privacy. However, we don't think that privacy is about like having something to hide, which it's kind of a popular saying. We think that privacy is about deciding and consenting what to share with others and what to keep to yourself. And also, like, like fairness in the economy is kind of jeopardized by public ledgers and transaction graphs being on chain. Uh, imagine that you're a local merchant uh, of your town, and there's a company that wants to compete there, and it's like opening a new shop. If you happen to accept like Bitcoin or Ethereum or any like open ledger and public transaction graph uh, cryptocurrency, they can easily uh, get all your, you know, your pricing policies and all that uh, and try to, you know, market dump you and, and compete unfairly. Moreover, in a more like day to day thing, um, there's a popular popular phrase by Ian Myers that you know said like says like crypto is uh, Twitter for your bank account. And, like, would you really be tweeting your bank account or letting your savings or your um, salary or your bank activity activity be public in the public in the in the blockchain? I don't think that's that's cool or safe or, or fair. <laughs> so, additionally, um, why ECC? So there are a few different privacy coins and there are a few different teams that are working on Zcash themselves, uh, the foundation, ECC, and then a lot of external units, um, <clears throat> excuse me. But ECC's mission is to empower people with economic freedom. So we believe clearly that that technology will help people access the fair and open currency we just discussed. We, we believe that the framework we're creating protects people, protects their freedom, their dignity, their consent, and, and their security. There's people in the room right now wearing the Zcon 3 conference t-shirt that says, 
Privacy is consent on the back. That's a very powerful statement. All right, so we started thinking about this mission of um, like getting Zek in everybody's hands. And we started to think about, you know, what do we have right now at that time? Or what, what did we have? And, and, and we started like thinking about it. So uh, what's the Zcash user starter pack? Well, we can start with some cool 90s uh, cypherpunk vibes. That it's always important. Then, uh, uh, you know, your usual uh, Faraday cage laptop, you know, uh, custodi with a cat custodian. Uh, really cool art uh, on the node. And also sprinkles of anarchism, which uh, are always really necessary. So but that's, that's, I'm sorry, that's not enough to, you know, you can get enthusiastic that with this, but it's not enough to get people with, you know, sack into people's hands. Exactly. So we had to create a proof of concept from scratch. We targeted Androids to start with. Uh, this is the Google material library. Um, so it has a kind of general look and feel you might be associated with, um, might associate with Google. Uh, but we had to create the MVP, basically. We had to know what the feature set was that a user needs. So we have your send and your receive, your ability to see your wallet transactions in history, uh, your ability to see the balance, and of course, your ability to share your address. So in that spirit, we learned a lot from that POC. And we wanted to get Zach in everybody's hands. And for that, we needed developers to adopt Zach in their existing wallets. So our goal was to create an SDK, which is a, a set of tools that allow developers to quickly use uh, Zek uh, in their existing code. And we also wanted to ship some demo apps to um, you know, help them through the process. The demo apps are basically code that it's really simple and straightforward and identify core use cases like sending, receiving, syncing, seeing your history, or things like that. Um, they also provide examples uh, on how to use the SDKs. And we also uh, have uh, the opportunity to share some common code uh, with the community. So if there are enhancements that are proposed, or if there are any issues that we need to troubleshoot, we have a common ground to do it there. And also, even though like the demo apps are a little bit rough, um, they really show that things work, and uh, you know you, ha you don't have to trust. You have you you can verify it. Our idea was to you know we imagined that developers would just um, you know have that idea of like adopting adopting Zek on their wa uh, wallets or applications. So when they went to the repo and downloaded the code, they can open this sample project where you know they can have the simulator on one side of the screen and the IDE on the other, and just have like one one to one uh, relationship on what to do and how to do stuff. Like how do I get a new address? Or how, how do I know the latest block height? Or uh, how do I send? Or how do I sync? Things like that. Just really straightforward. It's not you know uh, the pinnacle of great code, but it's easy to understand and to know how things work. But we know that, um, Dodger said it yesterday, code alone doesn't cut it. It is not enough uh, to have code, and we needed to do something else uh, about uh, this of getting Zek in everybody's hands. So what we did is we switched um, to upgrading that proof of concept now to an actual wallet that worked a little bit uh, better and was a little bit slicker. We updated the design and we open sourced it. Uh, so now you'll see that we have some design patterns on the screen that um, ended up not being the best, where you see the 12.3, that was actually the amount that you were selecting to send to someone. So some people would come to this screen, since they hadn't started that flow, that transaction, they would see zero and be very confused about their balance. So we learned some things from this. Um, however, it looked great, and uh, it was able, since it was open source, it was actually absorbed by the community. That's uh, where ZWallet came from, uh, and uh, really did help us move forward. Yeah. I think you meant Nighthawk. Oh, yep, yeah. sorry. I mean Nighthawk. Um, so we went from a proof of concept to a reference wallet um, with the idea of like, if you build it, they will come. And we were targeting developers mostly. 
um, as our users uh, for that application. And it also exercised the open source SDK. And our idea is to, was to target like 90% of, of people out there. Geffen can explain a little bit more about how we did that research. Yeah, so we actually used the carrier studies. So we made sure that we targeted Apple and iOS and Android devices. Um, so Apple and Google, iOS and Android. And we made sure that we could get working on every device that was being supported by those companies currently. Um, well, not, it's not every device, sorry. 90% of those devices. Uh, and this would allow us to reach uh, most of the markets in the world, most of the third world countries where we really wanted to help that economic freedom. Yeah, and also there's a special mention to, um, well, Zuko and other people at ECC that helped us test the whole thing by just uh, going to their local coffee shop in, in, you know, in Colorado and in Denver, I think, and buying coffee every day and, you know, sharing videos of the purchase of the merchant, of the baristas, uh, you know, cashing their tips on with Zach and using the wallet. And, you know, we, every day for, I guess, a year, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's still a lot of coffee. Um, we got like this report from our coffee testers uh, using the, the wallet internally uh, at ECC and we were able to fix a lot of things. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for all that, all those coffees and all that time. And we also decided that um, it would be really cool to, to make the reference wallet public in, for the Bitcoin hackathon we had at mid-2020, it mm -hmm. seems like really long ago, um, where we had um, a protect privacy theme in Gitcoin. Um, Ccash was, was there, but there were other projects as well. And we used the, the reference wallet as the example instead of the demo apps. So that reference wallet was adopted, excuse me, the SDK was uh, ingested by the community. We have Unstoppable and Edge that came up and started using it, and Nighthawk, as, as I mentioned. Um, this is great. We're seeing the community adoption that we wanted. We also started having office hours where we allowed different uh, community groups or projects to reach out to us if they needed help. And yeah, about the hackathon and design sprints, we use those instances to actually improve the, the things we do. And for example, the hackathon helped us um, polish the developer experience. We had many projects um, uh, that used uh, the SDKs and the, the, they competed for prizes and the winning one was um, Z-Act, which um, was a, oh, an application to use Zek memos uh, to organize protests in Central America, which was uh, pretty, pretty good. And we also got a lot of um, <clears throat> like EC bounties, like localization for the ECC wallet. So like um, there, there are a lot of uh, people that reached out and, and share their knowledge in different languages and you know, translated the ECC wallet uh, to, to many, many languages. Yeah, it should be clear uh, that we're not, it wasn't a protesting privacy. It was a privacy app that was yeah. for, for organizing protests. Um, additionally, internally, uh, in, the, in the team in ECC, we were doing design sprints. So we're using the Google design sprint methodology. We'd take a week, we'd collaborate and concentrate our efforts on uh, basically cr creating a list of all the new features or concepts we have, looking for innovative ideas, creating rapid prototypes, testing them with real users, getting their feedback, synthesizing that feedback for all the points that we want to use in the future. And uh, we created what came out of this design sprint was unified addresses. But during the design sprint, our rapid prototypes were on other demos. And when we gave these demos to our, our user base, which are friends and family for a, a week like that, um, we found a universal confusion about their wallet address. They simply were constantly confused on, on what they should be sharing, where it should be shared. And so we kind of asked ourselves, what if the user didn't need to worry about their address? Yeah, um, that was a, like the founding question. What if there were no addresses? Um, so we came up with unified addresses, which are a way to um, 
put every kind of uh, receiver uh, uh, of you know in Ccash in into a single uh, address. Um, when the core team came with the news that you know they they started work on Halo and the Orchard Shielded Pool, we also had this um, this uh, exciting news about having a new address type. And although we were really happy about like you know getting rid of the trusted setup and and having this new pool, we knew that that was going to be a problem for users. So we decided to start thinking about a pattern where no matter how many uh, new shielded pools our core engineers uh, from uh, the whole ecosystem you know, they could create, we, were, we will have a pattern to include them in unified addresses so users don't have to worry about that and they can always be updated to the latest technology. Um, it also helps like um, with accidental errors or you may be sending to the wrong address or you don't, or you even you know having to learn about the protocol to know why don't you why you can't use a transparent address in some website and you need to use the Z1 and th that was really complicated so unified address help with that and then there's the shielded by default thing where it helps you always stay on top of um, your privacy choices. We originally thought that we could design a wallet that would automatically shield stuff for you, like, and we call that auto shielding. But we found that, um, you know, since privacy is consent, it's, it's users must decide when to shield their, their funds and not wallet developers. So um, with shielded by default, uh, users can always choose when to shield funds. Maybe the app will actually suggest that this is a good time to shield because of the amount or something like that, but they they can always like opt out or come back later to shield their funds uh, when they want. And this is really important because it gives you like privacy uh, consistency in the use and it also helps you to always choose the, the best option available uh, when transacting with Ccash. Uh, with unified addresses and Sheila by default, the software will always help the user to either um, be compatible with the other party and also always have like the best shielded option available. Um, yeah, and it should be made clear that uh, the SDK, not the protocol, only allows you to send from shielded so that we kind of made the compromise between auto shielding and shielded by default to make sure they use the secure part of the wallet. Yeah, totally. So we have a small elephant in the room. Um, there is a current issue with wallets um, where we are simply seeing a huge increase in shielded transactions. We have a large shielded transaction load uh, on our, our pool usage and um, we're talking so we expected with Halo that any growth we were having currently would be somewhat minimized. Instead, we're seeing dozens of transactions per block additional. We're seeing around 1,700 outputs, this is the real deal, that are just choking uh, the processing units on both the mobile devices, the light wallet D, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, the transactions aren't in shielded pools, so we don't know what users are using this for. Um, some people have mentioned they think it's spam. It could be completely a good actor using a new use case we're not aware of. Um, well, we're going to have to see what that is. It's going to be interesting finding out. But what's, in, what's, in, what's kind of amazing about this is this is a problem we want to have. This is going to allow us to future-proof. Um, it's, it's, we're going to create scaling solutions and optimize our code to the point where we don't have to worry about any sort of scaling usage that comes up. Um, however, mobile optimizations are required now we have some usability failures because of this. While we do have a progress bar and we do have um, interaction with the user to tell them what's happening with their wallets, since we went from a timeline of 45 minutes to days sometimes for syncing, especially on initial syncs, if you're up to the, the tip, honestly, you can sync as long as you're doing it every day, but users aren't gonna be using that wallet every day. Weekly, maybe monthly uh, is more realistic. So we had a usability failure there. We had the visibility of system status. You could not tell what your wallet was doing. Seeing 0% or even 1% is not great. Um, coming back 
half a day later and seeing 20% makes you feel a little bit better, but that's half a day. Who's waiting around for half a day? So what approaches are we exploring? Well, uh, we have a couple of things. First, at the node or Lightwell D level, something important to say is that the protocol is still operating as usual and as intended. It's just the transaction load is higher. Um, so the funds and everything are safe. Um, they just take a little bit longer to see them. A, well, a little or a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the light uh, wallet D level, uh, um, so our processing is, is going through uh, basically its own version of a node where it is also having to sync. So when that processing is crashes because it's had too much information and it can't handle it. It's filled up its memory that it's allowed and crashed. We weren't writing to hard disk because we had such efficient code at the time that we didn't need to write to hard disk. So then that process that just crashed has to be rebooted. It actually also had to sync and that would take maybe 45 minutes. Yeah, something like that um, um, was mentioned by uh, Zondak, yeah, Zondak yesterday that they had to reboot the LightWallet D and everything take some time. And yeah, that's that's why it, it just forgets about the cache block blocks because it uses the RAM memory. So when you reboot it, that's lost and it needs to sync again. We know that uh, people from lightwallet.com do have load balancing. So the occasional lightwallet like going down and rebooting doesn't not, like uh, leave you totally offline, but it's still an inconvenience. And you know, it, there are cost increases in infrastructure and all that, that we're working to solve and make LightWallet uh, resilient to this kind of situations. Also at the mobile level, we have a lot of things to do. And we had this plan, but we had to reschedule everything and rethink what will come next uh, to accommodate to this situation. So in the short term, what we are doing at the SDK level is to work on reducing the memory footprint Currently, we were batching downloads, and since the blocks are bigger, everything is bigger. Uh, the compact blocks are not so compact, and the devices could be struggling to process them and store them. Uh, so th those are some changes that we're preparing that, are, that can be developed in, short in the short term. Um, and also, we're reducing the amount of blocks we cache on disk, so we don't like filling your phone, you know, with blocks instead of like you being able to use your, you know, your photos and have memories there and not just cache blocks. And, and then in the medium term, we're working to do a whole uh, overhaul of the, of the SDKs so that they can uh, change completely the way they sync. Um, we have uh, yet another sync algorithm, which is called uh, DAX sync uh, from that's from Strat on the core team, which basically means that it's a directed acyclic graph where it jumps jumps from one node to another to first make your funds uh, available quicker, and then try to minimize the amount of blocks that are needed to process. We currently process everything um, regardless of what your wallet's like. And that could be really improved so that we can save uh, time and, and resources while still like uh, retaining anonymity. And with this, there are gonna be like database overhauls and uh, changes in the architecture and, and, and a lot of um, changes in the APIs that we will actually be proactively helping uh, partners to adopt mm -hmm. because we know that there are, we're having a lot of changes and. In, in short time and we want to be fair to them and help them along the way. Mm -hmm. So across the level, we're going to be reducing bottlenecks and improving uh, speed. Uh, I should mention that there are some protocol changes that can be done as well. Um, that's not our wheelhouse. We can't exactly speak to those. So what does the future bring? Uh, we know that we're going to create a, another wallet offering um, currently called the ECC wallet. It will still be open source. It will still be the most viable product first. It is open source from the day one. Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you can check it out right now. Yeah. And um, we have a roadmap of future plans. So we know still that we have memo use cases that we'd love to do. There's point of sale 
uh, like invoicing and receipts that would be great to use the memo for. We know that we would like to sign the reply to so you can prove that you're you. Uh, so that we can reduce any phishing attacks that could be using, that could be using the memo. Um, if you're a PayPal or Venmo of the world, you need your contacts. So we need to have an address book. We need to be able to access the contacts. And so we need to do some privacy protection security around that as well. Um, we've seen a lot of use of the memos for messaging threads. So we wanna make that a little more native in our clients so you can go see your conversations with the people you've been sending money to, sending exec to. And we also know that we're trying to move into this Web3 world and be a little bit closer to where everyone is doing their business and doing their day-to-day -day activities. So Web3 is a hype word in some time. So I, I like to take a moment to talk about our definition. And when I say our definition, I am talking about Paku and I's, uh, <laughs> the wallet teams, not necessarily all of ECCs. So first of all, it's very easy if you just say Pi. So Pi is our definition of Web3, privacy, identity, and ease of use. So on the privacy side, it's your data not big ads. And this is pretty much similar to most people's definitions of Web3. On identity, it's a little more important to prove ownership of who you are. And uh, there's some examples in the world out there right now, um, POAPs, uh, soulbound tokens, basically any social on-chain reputation, you need to be able to own that and prove it. And then general ease of use, really this is UX, but PIUX isn't the best word. So ease of use is, uh, getting that user experience to be world-class, getting it to the point where people are getting uh, both that little bit of spark joy from sending because it was so seamless and easy to um, just being completely trusting and in love with their wallet. They're not worried about it anyway. And so we also know that we're gonna have some new features. We might be going proof of stake and we wanna make sure to build that for interoperability. We wanna make sure that you can use your wallet to put money and, and stake it right there. Um, however, I wanna be clear, your wallet should have the amount of Zcash in it that you're walking around, your, excuse me, your mobile wallet should have the amount of Zcash in it that you're you know, used to having in your normal wallet. You're, you don't wanna be able to lose all your stuff because you lose your phone. So I, wanna, I do wanna underline the fact that mobile wallets probably shouldn't be the, the app to stake from, but if that's a feature that Zec can do, we wanna make sure you can at least see it and uh, be exposed to it. Um, and then again, uh, it needs to be easy to use in the browser at, at whatever site you're on or whatever point of sale you're at, it needs to be able to work with their cash register. Um, commerce is definitely in the future for Zcash. Uh, so it's important, I think, to underline that here. A little bit more on proof of stake and uh, DeFi. So proof of work for Zcash is most likely going to proof of stake. Um, and once again, I, as I just said, this needs to be available in your wallet. Um, for the decentralized finance angle, um, proof of stake would allow us to get a return on your holdings, and that's great for the whales. Uh, but for a smaller user, I think it's more important to remember that Zec plus de definancing will allow kind of a hedge against a dystopia future. We'll be able to make sure that you are protected and private. So what have we learned so far uh, in our journey? So we thought that if you build it, they will come. But if they can't find documentation or, you know, testnet nodes, sorry, Francesco. <laughs> yeah, the Zondux had a really um, nice, uh, not nice experience with, you know, developer experience. So if they can't find um, good documentation and things like that, they will probably go, unless they're superheroes like Francesco from Zondex. Yeah. And so we are hiring, Josh uh, spoiled this, we are hiring a developer relations lead that will help us um, foster uh, a, you know, a better community and relationship with our um, development folks and also organize our docs and sample code and this kind of like live demo apps and, and resources um, to get Zach in everybody's hands. If you happen to know somebody that would be great at this job, or maybe if you think you would do it great, please go to electriccoin.co slash jobs. You will find uh, many job, uh, job postings there uh, and the developer relationships lead, relations lead, um, that's the name, um, is there and you can apply from there. So 
please do spread the word and we will uh, interview you, you or your friends. <laughs> um, so we also learned that people use many shielded wallets at the same time. They can't have enough. Like if they, we, we spoken with users and we've read the forums and uh, yeah, I have uh, like Nighthawk and Y wallet and Z wallet. And, and you know, if you put out a new one, they would install it. So people use many wallets at the same time. And they even, this is not recommendable, but they even use the same keys on, in all of them just to see what happens. And um, so we learned that um, we just have to expect the unexpected. People um, get Zek and use Zek however they want. And since everything's shielded and we don't track and we don't log anything, we certainly you know, have little idea of what you're doing besides what you share in the forums of what you tell us. But we have a, a great journey in, uh, in the wallet experience besides all the bumps that we are hitting. So we expect to you know, continue to be sharing all of this with you and um, have a, you know, keep having fun. Yeah. I do want to echo that. Uh, we don't know your problems unless you share it with us. So give us feedback all the time. And there we have it. Questions? Yeah, um, so there's a bunch of interesting questions here. And um, the first one is, why did ECC decide to build a wallet of its own, as well as building, uh, as well as build the wallet SDKs? And there's a follow-up question: Does the ECC wallet um, use the ECC wallet SDK, or does it have access to private API, uh, APIs? Yeah. So the second question kind of answers the first. Without ingesting our own SDK, we really can't test the wallet. We can't uh, do the due diligence that's required to make sure these things work. So. Um, we definitely want to provide assistance to the community. We want to help anyone that has a problem, but the best way to do that is through our own product, we find. Um, so we know the answers first. Um, I, can, I can talk more about that, and I can say that we definitely want more uh, community feedback that would let us know other things that we could offer that would help. Um, but giving the STK out and the tools and the code uh, we thought was the best path for the community to make their own wallets. You want to add? Um, no, I, that's pretty much what we were thinking about when we want to develop our own app. Yeah, I think the build it uh, and they will come failing and making making us realize that you know code isn't enough also translates directly into us having our own wallet as a sort of flagship product. Um. There's an ongoing discussion on Discord about uh, these three questions. What is the sync algorithm? Who is writing it? And um, has the sync been benchmarked against other things in the wild? Okay, yeah, the sync algorithm is called DAG sync. Uh, it's, uh, it's being worked by the core team at ECC. I think it's mainly a creation from Strat but I'm not sure he probably collaborates with the rest of the team. And what was the third question? Uh, has the sync been benchmarked against other things in the wild? It's been developed, so um, we have like theoretical benchmarks, but as it's a huge rewrite of the whole thing. And the change on, on these SDK architecture um, is really, really huge. So to be able to benchmark it, we need to do a fair amount of development. But as soon as we have any numbers and any figures, we will share it, share it with you and with the community. Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that. Um, uh, if you were at the Zebra D uh, yesterday, you saw some dashboards they had. Uh, and there was a question if you could put those put the, the front end, the Rust front end basically in front of Zcash D node. That will allow us also to do some, if we can do that, we'll be able to do some sync times there and we can also we have a light wallet dashboard as well so we'll be able to do it on uh, pro a protocol level on the light wallet level and on the mobile level and um, another question is there going to be two different code bases Android and iOS and a follow-up question um, will the native guts be modularized so that most of the code code 
could be reused for different targets such as Wasm, Node, Python. Okay. Yeah, for the first question, yeah, there there are two separate code bases. Um, one for Android developing Kotlin um, and Compose. We always try to, uh, we don't run uh, behind uh, like technology hype. We try to think about where technology is going and and work towards that. That that's what happened with uh, the ECC wallet and um, and um, coroutines. When we started, coroutines in Android were experimental, and now it, they are like the the thing that is used uh, every day. So we have a uh, Jackpot Compose and Kotlin uh, code that uses the Rust crates and uh, we're sharing a lot of code, like the core business logic is shared through uh, Rust, and then the UI wallet uh, application code is in, in respective repositories. Um, the wallets always use the SDKs. Um, like we, we use the, the SDK, like it's not that we're shipping an SDK that we don't use. Uh, we would never do that. Um, and then the iOS wallet has its own stack, which is, uses like Swift UI, and um, it is developed with the comp the composable architecture, uh, which is a really novel um, kind of functional uh, modular architecture for iOS. Um, you can find if you go to the Ccash uh, GitHub, the projects are called called Ccant Android Wallet and Ccant iOS Wallet. That's the code name. Uh, we don't have a name for the branding. Wallet. A name yeah. will come. <laughs> the the name will come some. I don't know another day. Not today. Um, and you can download the code. You can check it out. It builds, and um, it uses the SDK. And if you go to the commit history, you will see that it's open from day one. And I forgot lo the last question. Uh, other platforms. Other platforms. Okay, we are. Like other languages. Okay. Awesome. Um, so we are doing a couple of things on that front. The Android wallet is uh, designed to split code uh, into like platform specific sections so that we can uh, use Kotlin multi platform in the future. We don't have that on the roadmap officially, but. Um, if you plan for that since the beginning, it's like 5% of the work, kind of. If, you, if you're like two years after, one year after development, you decide to do multi-platform, it's like a huge of amount of work you need to do to accommodate the code for different platforms. So we are leaving that door open. We don't have anything planned officially, um, but that's one thing. And then there are a couple of things that we are exploring um, regarding this architecture overflow, uh, overflow, well, it's overflowed, <laughs> overhaul um, that we're doing. Uh, this is like kind of under the hood stuff where we have a bunch of databases and the Rust code and the Kotlin Swift code share some databases that really, that's really complicated to handle. So we're thinking how to manage that. So there are a couple of things that we're uh, discussing, we have on the table, which is like um, Mozilla Unify as, as a possible interface for FFI, which could, that could allow um, like many other languages to, to use the Rust crates, uh, you know, in a, in a simpler way. Um, but yeah, that's kind of premature. Are, are there, those are discussions we are having. Um, we totally accept any suggestions on the R&D Discord, uh, but yeah, things are moving a lot, and uh, we're moving things around. We're moving, moving furniture around <laughs> the house uh, all the time. So yeah, we're we are aware that we want like Zach in many languages um, and platforms. So we're having that in mind. Um, there are no other questions or disco on Discord, so um, does anyone in the room have any? Sir? Uh, is, uh, a few questions. Uh, 
I'm, uh, I come from Bitcoin and Ethereum. I'm new to Zcash. I'm learning here. Uh, one question is, does the new, the, the, the new five, does the Zcoin B still support the proof? Uh, we're not core yeah, engineers. We're not exactly so the, sorry. I'm, we're, I'm kind of not the I person to, to yeah, that. to answer <laughs> that question. I got a couple of questions. Yeah, okay. Do you mind if we repeat the questions out sure, loud? Yeah. yeah. So the gentleman asked if like uh, NU5 CCashD supports pruning, um, but I don't know the answer for that question. Uh, next question is, uh, I, I'm used to using the Python API. It sort of overlaps the questions asked previously. I'm used to using uh, Web3.py for parsing the Ethereum blockchain, and also you know you can use Bitcoin to do uh, uh, RPC requests. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's repeat the kind of phrase. Yeah, uh, the audience is asking if there's some something similar to a Python interface like Web3.py or maybe Web3.js that lets you like simply uh, interact with a blockchain through an API. Um, not exactly. You can use the Rust grades. You have you have the Zcash, um, let's say while CLI which is a, like an, it, it, it's a CLI that has an interactive and non-interactive uh, mode that you can use to um, interact with, with the blockchain. Yeah, so sort of, sort of, uh, um, sort of RPC calls. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, those are like RPC calls and you can, uh, Zach Wallet uh, Lite uses that to actually uh, do all the wallet thing as a backend. Uh, I think that's the closest you have to some web three dot language kind of API, but um, we're, yeah, it would be great to have something like that uh, develop. Yeah. That and yeah, and then you have, yeah, Chris, Chris Nauticum is there from the core team. Um, then if you want, you can like just have a side chat over there. Um, great. And yeah, you have the RPC documentation and read the docs, or you can use the Zcash D CLI to see what RPCs you have there available. There are kind of a lot. Uh, you have like transparent RPCs and then shielded RPCs. The shielded ones, I think they have a prefix with a Z in the front. Mm -hmm. Would with it be correct to say that also Lightwall D uses those RPC APIs? Yeah, then you have, if you use a light client approach, you can um, uh, get a node up and have a, um, in a different instance or in the same uh, light quality setup, and then you can use the RPCs uh, of light quality, uh, which are a little bit different. There is more succinct and compact, like for uh, light clients to use, like get high, that you can like get a block range or get a tree state, um, things like that. And then you, if you want to learn and do weird stuff, I encourage you to look at Darkside Dark Wallet D which is an evil um, light wallet D that lets you create a synthetic blockchain to uh, reproduce reorgs, transactions like changing indexes and all of the weird stuff uh, that you can do. Uh, you, you should never deploy that live. There are many uh, safeguards so people don't do that, but it's a great testing tool. We use it, I always use it before I release anything, I just, uh, start my dark side wallet D and I run some integrations tests on the iOS side and if everything's green, everything's safe. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I think we are good. So uh, thank you guys very thank much. Thank you very much.